the Go for Growth Show, powered by Beepo. Welcome to this episode of the Go for Growth Show. My name is Mark Engelman, and I'll be your host today. I'm really happy uh, on today's episode to have uh, Mark Bowater, the owner of uh, Top Lock Locksmiths, uh, a Brisbane-based uh, locksmith company, um, on the show. So welcome, welcome, Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, let's get straight into it. So along with Top Lock Locksmiths, you're also the president of the Brisbane Chapter for Entrepreneurs Organisation. Can you explain to the audience what EO is and, and what does your role in EO entail? Sure. Uh, EO is an organisation for owners or founders of businesses uh, with revenues greater than US one million a year. Uh, global organisation with I think something like about 13,000 members now, about 550, 600 or something and across Australia and New Zealand. Um, so in the Brisbane chapter, which I'm president of, we have about 120 uh, entrepreneurs as members uh, and we have about 20 uh, in what's called the Accelerator Program. So that's a program for uh, businesses between 150,000 and a million turnover. Uh, and it's about helping them to scale up and, and grow and ultimately sort of get over the million. Uh, my role is the, uh, is the president of the Brisbane chapter. I have, I have a board uh, of about 10 or so, and uh, we are all about running the chapter to effectively sort of suit the members in terms of uh, what members are looking for. Um, there are a number of products that, that uh, EO has, um, learning events, uh, forums, um, uh, global and regional sort of learning events and so on. Uh, we're really about sort of uh, assisting with those and then also um, doing whatever we can do for our members to uh, help them in business. Yeah, great, great. So, um, you know, it's a pretty common story that you hear sometimes about business owners who uh, might just be sort of starting out and early on in their sort of entrepreneurial life. Um, and, you know, often the network at that time consists mainly of people that are employed in jobs, not typically owning their own businesses or, or maybe even not that interested or knowledgeable about, about running a business and business strategy and that sort of stuff. Um, so how does, how does EO address, address that for, for entrepreneurs? To some extent, I, I think that's the biggest benefit, and that's the, the real gain in EO. Um, when I joined EO seven years ago, I actually was living in Mackay in central Queensland at the time. Uh, I had been in business for about 10 years by myself. Uh, none of my family effectively were in business, none of my friends were still in business, um, and I didn't really have anyone to talk to. Um, uh, whatever I did was, was fluke, good luck, whatever. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I heard of uh, Entrepreneurs Organisation and, uh, and I was like, what's this? Uh, I'd never even heard of them. Um, uh, and I uh, went and checked out the website and uh, as soon as I read it, I went, that is what I've been looking for. Just uh, follow people to sort of bounce ideas off um, and so on. And so <clears throat> um, a large part of EO uh, is that whole um, people who have been through the same experiences uh, as you before. Uh, I guess one of the um, cornerstones of EO is that we don't give each other advice because uh, everyone's willing to get advice. I get advice from people all the time, but they're not people who have necessarily been through uh, it and, and have their house on the line and those sorts of things. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so EO uh, is, is, uh, is about experience sharing. Uh, and you'll be amazed, uh, you know, when you're in business and you have uh, employee issues, you know, cash flow issues, all those sorts of things. Uh, everyone else has been through the same issues. Um, and so the depth of uh, experience sharing that you can get from other members of EO who have been through those issues before is just extremely useful. Uh, and so that really is, is a large part of, uh, of one of the benefits of EO. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in EO who call it their tribe, basically. I found my tribe, a bunch of people who sort of think like me, can't sleep at night, they wake up at three o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat about something or whatever. I mean, that's, we're, we're all the same. We all, we all sort of do that and, and we can relate to it, you know, when someone else is uh, talking about something. Um, so uh, I certainly think of it as my tribe, that's for sure. Yeah, cool. Um and so you've, you've 
we've already shared a couple of examples of how EOs helped you. Um, have you got any other examples to share about how being a member of EOs really helps you with your business? Oh, it's a, it's a total change of life, I suppose. It's changed my life massively. Um, like I say, I've been in business for about 10 years. Uh, I probably didn't really understand the value of personal growth and personal learning beforehand. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like reading books, but I wasn't really into business books and, and those sorts of things. Uh, mm. uh, EO has five core values. One of the core values is thirst for learning. Um, <clears throat> I um, have uh, just uh, started reading business books and, and just the, the, you know, the, the learnings out of those business books, uh, the learnings from going along to EO learning events. You know, the Prisma chapter probably has... 15 to 20 sort of learning events a year, which range between business speakers, uh, personal growth speakers, family events, Christmas parties, sort of, sort of those sorts of things. But just the, the range of speakers that I've seen, uh, and, and I guess my my general knowledge, I suppose, I would describe it about business is, is just grown massively. Um, and and in terms of sort of, you know, life changing, I mean, I, I had a mining engineering business when I joined uh, the O. Uh, a consulting uh, business had about sort of 25 consultants or so. And uh, I was actually at a, uh, an EO um, global learning event in New Zealand. Uh, we were playing a game of golf, uh, myself and, and one of my EO mates who was at the same university. As we were walking around playing the game of golf, we uh, were talking about what the perfect business looked like. And we started listing a whole pile of criteria. The first one was no employees, but two that <laughs> deal with sometimes. And the second one was no difficult customer relationships that you had to maintain, because that's hard work as well. Uh, and then other things like, you know, earns, earns revenue 168 hours a week instead of just 40. And so we came up with about 15, uh, 15 um, sort of criteria for the perfect business. And when I looked at my, my current consulting business, it ticked about two of those boxes and that was about it. Uh, and until I joined EO, you know, I had always sort of thought to myself, um, you know, should I do something different? Should I change business or something? And I'd always sort of thought to myself, why stop doing something that I know and that I have 25 years experience in or whatever to go and do something that I don't know? Uh, you know, I mean, that just sounds illogical. Um, uh, but it was that day uh, playing that game of golf that the, the seed was planted that in the scheme of businesses, you know, a, um, a professional services business is hard work. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of boxes that potentially doesn't tick. So that day, the day that I uh, began the journey of, uh, of selling um, my <coughs> consulting business, that had I not joined EO, I never, never would have even crossed my mind. I would continue to say to myself, just keep doing what you're good at. That's, you know, that's, that's it. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, that it's not really scalable, is it? And it's often those sorts of ser professional services businesses often sort of are a result of the the founder or the owner and Correct. it's often Very, hard to take a backwards or a sideways yeah. step out out of that business isn't it very hard for you to not be the central cog that uh, that everything rotates around. That's one of the things that I've, I found most difficult as the founder of the business and, and uh, the person that long-term customers were used to dealing mm. with and so on. They, they don't want to deal with anyone else. They, they want to deal with you. Um, and even just uh, peace of mind, you know, overseas, overseas on a holiday or something like that and there's something happening some client's supposed to get some report or scheduled by a date and it hasn't happened and so on. I mean, I... You know, I was halfway up Mount Fuji, climbing Mount Fuji, staying in sort of one of the uh, Mount Lodges, sitting there with my uh, laptop doing a schedule sort of at uh, 10 o'clock at night while everyone else was mm. sleeping because we are getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning to get up there for sunrise and so on. And it's things like that. I'm thinking, I was like, why? What, what am I thinking? Why am I doing this? You know? yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, from a professional uh, services point of view, it's hard to get out of it. Yeah, and I guess in some respects, that's also the difference between a business owner and an entrepreneur in that an entrepreneur is someone who's, you know, interested in business and interested in growing and scaling businesses, but not necessarily working within the business, I guess. Correct. One of the first things that I, you know, that, uh, that I, uh, I suppose I learned to know was uh, ultimately, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, the aim is to make yourself redundant. Mm. Uh, business, runs, business runs without you. Uh, I like the whole concept of uh, choosing, choosing, uh, you know, uh, whether I go to work today or not, or, or choosing 
um, what exactly what tasks I'm doing. So, so yes, that concept making yourself redundant is uh, is one I can address. Yes, yes. My my dad always used to tell me about Tuesday. You can choose whichever day you like to go <laughs> to work. <laughs> Every day is Tuesday. Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, like that concept. I remember that one. Nice. Um, so I'm also connected with you on Facebook, Mark, and I love how you use it as a platform to kind of engage with, you know, your network and kind of conduct, you know, market research on various different tactics that you've sort of been thinking about <laughs> and looking to use at Top Lock. Have you always been that consultative in as a, as a sort of a business owner or, or has EO developed that in you, do you think? I certainly don't think I've always been that consultative. I, I've always, I, you know, I certainly have, have never thought that I've had the solution for everything and that I know everything. Um, you know, you can learn from everyone. Um, and so I uh, endeavour to try and do that. Um, <clears throat> I guess I have always seen Facebook as a tool uh, with some use to some extent. So in, uh, in my um, mining consulting business, um, uh, supply and demand meant there was plenty of work out there, but it was very hard to find engineers. Uh, there was a, an extreme shortage of uh, engineers. So I actually used Facebook as probably one of my primary recruiting tools for a number of years, mm. where I, as, uh, <clears throat> I personally, with my personal profile, would just make friends with mining engineers around Australia anyway, uh, and effectively um, cultivate them to some extent via Facebook. Uh, and you know it's 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 amazing. You know uh, you would just see posts on their wall about something they weren't happy at work, or bad at work, or something like that. And mm. and uh, you just you get these insights. And so then I would just say, hey, you, you want to change a job or whatever sort of and so on. So um, <clears throat> it was it was my recruitment tool rather than seek, for example, for a long time. Um, and uh, so you know with with top up with my locksmith business, uh, different dynamics. Uh, employees are not so hard to find. It's not so much a recruitment tool, uh, but you know, with with sort of 100 friends or whatever it is, certainly a good market research tool. And so I, I just tend to use it for, for different means. You know, <clears throat> um, you know, you can get information from Google Analytics and all those other sorts of things, but sometimes that doesn't really give you the personal insight that you need. It's just numbers and so on. So I like to sort of <clears throat> see some of the comments or some of the reasons or the feedback. Uh, that I get from a post um, because it's one of those fascinating things that when you get inside an industry and I mean I'm not even a locksmith but you know, I haven't now been uh, involved in a locksmith for four years uh, locksmith business for four years I now know so much more than I did before uh, and so I don't necessarily think like uh, Joe Blog down the road about my house or my business or something anymore because I know the sort of the, the, the security solutions I should be thinking about um, so it helps me to get back to, to sort of basics to some extent to just to uh, read some of the, um, the feedback that I get from some of my questions. Uh, but in terms of the consultative side, um, no, I think EO has definitely helped, de definitely helped with that. Um, um, you know, I, uh, I will consult uh, fellow EO as uh, with questions just all the time now. You know, there's a chapter of 120 and I, I pretty much know the 120 of them personally, so I can jump on the phone and ask any of them a question at any point in time. Um, and, uh, you know, just last week I sort of had a business issue, a potentially significant business issue. And I probably spoke to seven, six or seven EOs on the day, gave them a call. Uh, they, they didn't necessarily have had that experience before. It was something that was relatively unique. Uh, but, you know, I could still get um, some thoughts from them on what they would do sort of in that scenario and so on now. And uh, I think back to when I first joined <coughs> EO and I probably really hadn't got the hang of it to some extent. I made, des made decisions and did things that cost me a heck of a lot of money that I look back now and I think to myself, geez, I had like a whole pile of EO mates. Why didn't I ask someone? Why didn't I get a second opinion or something? You know, I, I just look back now and think about how stupid I was to some extent. And, uh, and so I, I, I sort of, uh, I endeavoured to, to try not to make the same mistakes again if someone else in EO has already made that same mistake. Yes, yes. No, that makes complete sense. Um, you're telling me um, the other day that you've recently partnered with another EOA. Um, and, and that you've sort of merged your businesses together, um, which gives you the opportunity to play to your strengths and, and your own interests. Um, can you tell me about that? 
Yeah, a bit of, bit of lateral thinking, I suppose, to some extent. I, I'm always one for sort of um, uh, looking at opportunities from a different different perspective and so on. So I'm an engineer. I love numbers. That, that's why I give, call me for the spreadsheets. I can just do those sorts of things all day. So so I have a sort of fairly operations, finance, processes background, which is I hate sales and marketing. It's just not me. I'm not a salesman. You know, uh, you know I'd probably... Uh, I'd rather go to the dentist than make cold calls to some extent. So, so, um, so, uh, and, and you know, I, uh, I've made some fairly good friends in EO, and, and there's a, another EO uh, who I've been friends with for about five years or so. <clears throat> and she runs a marketing, she owns a marketing um, business, and she loves sales and marketing. She hates numbers uh, and hates processes and so on. And so we sat down and started having some discussions about, well, you know, uh, I have strengths in one area, she has strengths in a different area, and they're complementary. Uh, and maybe we could do something a bit smarter with that. So we started the process where we would actually spend a couple of hours a week in each other's business. So I would come in and sort of, you know, set up a cash flow for her or sort of uh, get a, you know, do some break even type numbers or those sorts of things. And she would come in and help us sort of sales and marketing them. Um, and that was that was going that that was going really well actually. And so we sat down and said, well, that's probably really just the, the beginning of the journey, isn't it? Well, mm. what if we just ramp it up from here? And so we sort of discussed the concept of, all right, let's uh, let's effectively throw all our businesses in a pool, uh, work out some uh, some uh, ownership arrangement sort of, and so on. And then um, uh, Belinda now looks after sales and marketing across all of the businesses. Uh, and I look after operations and finance for these other businesses. So uh, we now have sort of four businesses in a pool that we are 50-50 owners of. Um, and I don't have to do sales and marketing stuff anymore. And, uh, and I love it. And uh, I just work on my flow, uh, which is sort of numbers and, and, uh, and analysis and process and, and operations from a point of view of managing people. You know, I, I enjoy dealing with people. So, so that suits me fine. Uh, she loves it because she doesn't have to do numbers anymore and administration and bookkeeping and all that sort of mm. stuff. And uh, she's just in charge of uh, sales and marketing sort of across the four businesses. So, so um, something, something, yeah, something a bit different that, you know, without something like EO, for example, the concept would never have even entered my mind. Um, um, mm. And uh, Belinda, you know, Belinda is a, she's a marketing, she's a creative, she's very different. So, yeah. so uh, I think it works pretty well. You know, we, we definitely have a fairly good aligned set of values. That, that's something that's critical mm. uh, for, for the relationship to work is to have the same values. And, and we sort of have the line, same, I wouldn't say we have identical long-term goals, but, you know, aligned long-term goals and aligned values. Um, and so uh, it just makes it easy to some extent. You know, I, I had partners in business previously uh, before I joined EO. And I can look back now and, and understand sort of why it didn't work and so on that I didn't necessarily understand at the time. You know, mm. and some of it is around, it's not just around skill sets, but it's around, um, it's around values and, and long-term goals and some of those sorts of things that I, I didn't have the wisdom at the time years ago to have those sorts of discussions. Uh, and clarification. So, so yeah, it's uh, from, from my point of view, we're about six months in. Um, yep. You know, we, we have about four businesses now. Uh, the long term aim is just to continue to scale those and, and add more opportunities as we see. And uh, and uh, between us, uh, have the skill set to tackle anything. Yeah, fantastic. That sounds really exciting. And <coughs> I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, sort of stay close to see how that all works out because I, I've never heard of anyone sort of doing that before. So that's, it's quite new to me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I know some other EOs who have gone into business together, you know, founded yeah. something new sort of, so I've seen a number of examples yeah. of that, but not necessarily take their existing businesses uh, yeah. and, uh, and um, uh, not merge them, but effectively, uh, you know, put them in a pool yeah. under a whole bunch of identity and so on, and go, all right, let's let's just change the dynamics of, of what we do. So, so yeah, I, I will be interested to see. How I say. <laughs> and it's interesting when you talk about you know business partnership, and you 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 were saying that it's not just about you know what skills are people bringing to the table, but it's also about you know align values and I guess having that underlying level of trust and you probably don't have that level of trust without being in an organization like EO because you've you've already spent years building a relationship with 
Belinda and building that level of trust and understanding each other's values. Um, yeah, that, correct. You don't really get that. Yeah, you don't really get that opportunity out outside of those sorts of organisations, do you? Yeah, no, because uh, because certainly EO uh, is about um, is about not discussing the ninety five percent of life that you can discuss with anyone anywhere anytime. Uh, you know, we talk about the five percent, discussing the five percent that mm. you you don't necessarily discuss with anyone else. Uh, and, and you know they're very much the highs and lows sort of a business, you know, um, and uh, and that requires a high level of confidentiality and trust to to uh, to have those discussions. So, you know, uh, by default, when you've been in EO with someone for a few years, that there's just an extremely high level of trust, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, from my point of view, um, the values alignment is just like. Uh, I just I don't have any um, lack of confidence in, in anything associated with you know, uh, Belinda and and um, us sort of uh, agreeing on paths forwards and decisions you know the sort of decisions that you have to make in business and, and the tough decisions sometimes and so on you know I, I just have a very high degree of confidence because of the background that uh, we'll all be fine. Yeah, cool, cool. All right, so. Um Let's rewind a little bit. One thing that always fascinates me about talking to business owners is where they came from and how they made, why did they make the decision to leave employment and start a business? And, yes. you know, cause I know that a lot of the listeners on this show probably aren't business owners and they probably are, you know, working in jobs that they may or may not be happy in and often toy with the idea of, of going out on their own and starting a business, doing something. Um, so it's always mm. good to hear the stories that business owners have about when they made that change in their life and what sort of triggered it and, and, and what happened. Yes. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so sure. Uh, I actually just studied civil engineering at, uh, at college and started uh, working uh, the main road straight out of uh, university. Uh, had thought about doing mining engineering when I was in school, but I didn't really know much about it and I just sort of left it. And, uh, but uh, I heard about the mining industry and uh, effectively the, how high the wages were. And I thought, I actually didn't mind the whole you know, concept of living out in the bush somewhere. I, I actually never mm. experienced that coming from Brisbane anyway. So I thought, geez, why don't I go and work out in the bush somewhere and earn double the wages that I'm on now? And so I did. I sort of got a job in the mining industry. Spent, I think, probably about uh, 10 or 12 years or so in various roles in, in mines in Queensland and Western Australia. Uh, and uh, working for sort of um, companies such as uh, Rio Tinto and Matisse and so on, and, and was busy uh, climbing the corporate ladder to some extent in terms of uh, mining, uh, mining the mining world rather than sort of a head office in the city. Um, and uh, in the back of my head, I always sort of envisaged that one day I might go into business, but it was never, it was never a priority. It was just a one day. I was, I was busy. I enjoyed enjoyed. You know, the, the challenges and the, and the work of, of, uh, of working at the mine sites. Um, and uh, I was working at a mine site and I was staying in a camp and it was about an hour and a half from home. And I had sort of young kids, they were sort of one and three uh, and so on. And I was away sort of three or four nights a week, uh, coming home sometimes midweek and so on. And uh, I got to the point where I just went, this is not, the family life doesn't match the sort of the work life. And uh, this is when I was, I was living in Mackay at the time and, and working in a mine a couple of hours in land. And so I thought to myself, I need to make a change. So I'm actually just going to get a job, a mining engineering job in Mackay. And I assumed that there would be a consulting company there or something that I could just get a job with and so be home every night. Mm. Um, and my assumption that there would be a consulting company there was because the Bowen Basin land from um, Mackay and Rockhampton is, is just a, you know, core part of the mining industry in Queensland. So I thought there will be a consultant just on its, you know, on its doorstep. Uh, I grabbed the yellow pages at the time, had a look, there was none. I just went, well, that doesn't work because um, that was that was my plan. I was just going to get a job with a consultant in the car and I don't want to move to Brisbane. Uh, and I went, shit, maybe I'll just start my own. Uh, and so it was more just that I wanted to make a personal change. Uh, there was no significant business drive at the time. Mm. In fact, I had always, uh, working in the mine sites, I'd always had a very lately opinion of uh, consultants. So, so uh, there was no drive for me to go and start my own consulting company. Uh, but the day I started, the day I sort of uh, turned up and did my first job, I just loved it. So 
from the very beginning. Um, mm. The variety of work, uh, you know, I, I would uh, I would turn up at a, at a mine site and have to go along to a meeting or something, and they would say, "Oh, Mark, you can take the minutes." And uh, back at my previous job, I would think, "Oh, shit, I don't want to take minutes. Who wants to do that?" Yeah. Um, you know, but I would turn up and I would think to myself, "Well, if you want to pay me X dollars an hour to take the minutes, fine, I will take yeah. the minutes." You know, so uh, so uh, so, and no task was boring. Uh, every mindset was different. Uh, there was just so much to learn um, versus being at the one mindset sort of for five years and, and finding some tasks mundane and repetitive. But mm. no task was mundane when you were changing mindset. So so I loved it from the very beginning, um, and uh, and I think I knew. I think I always knew when I started that I was going to scale the business. I, I think there was just something inside me that. that that was a drive and it, and it sort of didn't take me too long to realize that being a one-man band consultant in the mining industry meant that I was still doing a lot of travel a lot of work yeah. out at mine site so so I hadn't really changed the, the dynamics at home being away a lot so so fairly quickly it sort of became a decision of well if I stay as a one-man band forever I'm going to be traveling forever and yeah. a way for me to stop that is for me to have engineers working for me doing the travel um, and so uh, I think within a, I think a, after about a year, I put on my first employee and, uh, and uh, I knew that wasn't going to be enough. Um, I could see that I would probably need about at least five or something like that before I was spending most of my time at home. So, so the scaling, initially the driver was sort of uh, was the personal side more so than anything else. Um, and, and I think over time, uh, I sort of came to, to, uh, I came to uh, develop a real drive to some extent, you know, and, and I, um, I sort of uh, have a, a definition these days, so my, my own personal definition of different terms of a business owner and entrepreneur. And, and that is that for me, an entrepreneur sort of eat, lives and breathes their business. Uh, they think about it all the time. They, they wake up in the middle of the night uh, thinking about it and got to jot down some notes or whatever. Um, whereas I, I think a lot of business owners have effectively bought themselves a job to some extent. You know, it's yep. still eight to five and they go home and they switch off and so on. Yep. Well, I never switch off. Uh, and in fact, you know, even from a, uh, it's one of the things that I've really enjoyed about business is that it's given me the flexibility. Uh, I would probably still do the same number of hours in a week that, uh, that you know, a lot of people do from a work point of view, uh, but it doesn't have to be eight to five. The kids have got something on at school or whatever. I'll just start early that morning and I'll finish at two and, and head to the school, you know, or uh, I'll just sit down at the computer at night time and work. So, you know, I just work whenever I want. Uh, yeah. I still get the same amount of work done. So I love that. Uh, that's one of the things that I love from uh, from the point of view of, uh, of running my own business is that I still get the work done. I, I enjoy it. I, I just love doing it. Um, just get to do it when I want to do it rather than someone else telling me, you know. So, so um, it didn't sort of take me too long to uh, just start to get this this entrepreneurial consumption. I was somewhat consumed by my business and I enjoyed thinking about it. Um, and once I'd started the scale, then it was a, it was a bit of a case of well, you know, why why stop to some extent? So I did. I just kept scaling. And I you know I, I opened up a business office in addition to the Mackay office. Uh, got up to about 35 employees in total, sort of before I sold the business. Yeah. Um, and uh, and having decided to sell the business and, and do something else, um, I uh, was it was then a case of uh, of what. Um, and it's interesting because you know throughout my life you hear I've always heard people talk about the journey and so on. And being an, an engineer and a numbers man. I, Always thought the journey was, was a lot of crap to some extent. It was just about the end results. I was yeah. only ever interested in the outcomes or the end results. And the first time that uh, I actually sort of even started to notice and become interested in the journey was when I sold uh, my mining business. And I thought, what am I going to do now? Uh, and my first question was, you know, do I leave the mining industry or do I stay in the mining industry? And my second question was, uh, do I found, do I start something new again uh, or do I buy something? Because um, the concept of going to work for someone was, was, was not even an option that I sort of ever even thought about. So, so I spent about a year or so, uh, sort of, you know, on those two major decisions. Uh, in the end, I sort of decided variety was the spice of life. I'd, I'd spent 25 years or so in the mining industry. I go, let's go and do something different. So I decided yeah. uh, I would get out of the industry, and. Uh, and I thought to myself, my logic at the time was, oh, I'm too old to do it. I'm just buy something. 
So I decided I was just going to uh, buy a business and uh, and like all naive business owners, I just thought I'll buy a cash cow and the money will roll in and it'll all be good. So, you know, so that was the dream anyway. <laughs> so uh, so once uh, once I decided to buy a business, I, I then approached it from a fairly open-minded point of view. I didn't have anything in mind. What I did was I just had things that were not on the list. So, uh, you know, I knew I didn't want anything to do with food because of hygiene standards and all those sorts of things. I knew I didn't want anything to do with alcohol because of just licensing and regulations and everything. But I didn't want anything to do with sort of uh, uh, management rights or any of those sorts of things. I didn't want to buy a news agent that's seven days a week by 13 hours a day or sort of mm. something like that. So all I had was a list of businesses that did not even make the list. Um, and uh, then I just started looking and uh, I actually just started trawling sort of... Uh, Websites, brokers, websites, uh, and every business was an option. And I, um, I probably considered sort of fifty or so, something like that. Not, not in detail, just in, just uh, reading the information memorandum, those sorts of things. Hmm. Um, and in the end, finished up settling on a locksmith business that was about a kilometre and a half from home, which yeah. wasn't a key driver as to why I bought it, but it was just, a, it was just a bonus. I, I was sort of travelling into the city, so this concept of uh, working a kilometre and a half and away and nowhere near a main road was, was just fantastic. And it was funny because when I was considering buying the business, I said to my wife, you know, about buying this top lock, you know, we should mystery shop them. And she said, I already have, I used them. When we first moved into the home a year and a half ago, I got them in to do the work. I went, oh, were they any good? She said, oh, fantastic. I went, oh, great. And uh, and then like it was it was only a week or two later for some reason or other I was looking at my keys for my um, my old office in town with my mining business and sure enough there was top lock written on the side of the keys so they had actually been a locksmith as well so they were our locksmith in both uh, in both business and uh, private and it was it was funny because I just thought oh, this must it's meant to be it's meant to be. not that I'm into it it's meant to be but um, so yeah so um, I decided uh, you know the, the more I looked into um, the locksmith business, the more I liked about it, uh, some of the aspects uh, around sort of recurring revenue and those sorts of things. And, and admittedly, it didn't tick all 15 of my uh, ideal business criteria. Um, I think it probably ticked about eight to 10 or something like that. Um, but it was a, it was certainly a, a leap from my, uh, my Two boxes. consulting business. So, so yeah, so, um, so I, uh, I bought that business and uh, then just on a very steep learning curve about uh, locks and, uh, and the processes inside a locksmith business and all those sorts of things. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so we're coming to the end of the, of the interview. This is the second last question. Um, what's your number one tip for business owners and entrepreneurs looking to grow and scale? I think it. Uh, I think it. It. It, it, uh, it took me a while to sort of um, to really learn this to some extent. Um, uh, but but my my number one tip uh, is to get out of your own way to some extent. Uh, I remember, you know, one of my hardest days in business was when I put on my first employee, my first consultant, because I was worried every time he went to a mine site. I thought myself. This guy is carrying my reputation. He could go out there and he could be an idiot mm. and he could undo all of my hard work. Uh, and then the second one was difficult, but it was a little bit easier. And it got easier as I, as I put each sort of person on. Um, ultimately, I think for me, uh, the real learning was that, you know, uh, I've always sort of been one of, you know, if you want, if you want a job done right, do it yourself because, you know, you know exactly what you want versus, you know, trying to get someone else to do it. Mm. Um, I guess what I've realised over time is that uh, you know that uh, if I want it done right, I've got to do it myself. Um, will get in the way because you need to put on an employee to do that job for you, and they might only do it eighty percent as well as you, as you might do it. However, that eighty percent is good enough because it frees you up to think about where can I be putting my time that is a better return on investment time and, and I, I, a return on investment of time is something that uh, I think about all the time from, uh, from the point of view of you know I've got X hours a week that I'm going to put into work where can I put that that best uh, gives me the best return overall um, and so uh, you know stuck in that mindset of ah oh, geez I, you know I need this done right or whatever I'll do it uh, 
it, for me, just holds you back from the point of view of putting someone else on it and uh, you putting your time into something else. And, and that's a difficult thing for a lot of business owners is to, is to relinquish that level of control to some extent and trust someone else to do that job that you've always done and that you feel is critical in the scheme of things. So, so my number one tip is get out of your own way and, uh, and uh, be ready to uh, relinquish control. Yes, yes, very important. Um, last question, have you used any new technology apps or services recently that have really assisted you in, in saving time or, or growing and scaling? It's interesting. I love I love technology. I wouldn't say I'm an early adopter, and I, and I love apps and so on. But there are so many of them around these days. Uh, it's almost like there's too many. It's almost like there are too many platforms. You know, if you take communication from the point of view, you know, we use Skype. We use Skype internally within the company for a long time, and it just you know to reduce emails and that sort of stuff. And we've recently changed from Skype to Google sort of Hangout, and that was my IT guy sort of said, "I wish do this because this is better and so on." But there's WhatsApp and there's Slack and there are just so many platforms, so many uh, choices, uh, and, and people are wanting to change all the time. You know, my guys are sort of going, oh, we should switch from this to this. Um, and I, uh, I just sort of push back on a lot of that stuff. I like using the technology, but you know, let's try and sort of maintain some consistency to some extent. But I think the one technology thing that we have done uh, um, two and a half years ago in Toplock, uh, was an enterprise management system, so software for running the whole business effectively. And we, we put in Simpro. There was software there when I bought the business, but it was very outdated and, and uh, really uh, only had half of the information that you needed sort of and so on. So we did uh, went down the track of evaluation of a lot of options because there are, there are so many options and uh, decided on Simpro. Um, and, and the thing about the enterprise management systems is that, you know, if you're going to do it, they are a lot of work. To get it right, they are labour intensive from the point of view of what you have to input and check and everything to make sure that it's right. Because if you don't, it does become a bullshit in, bullshit out exercise. Um, and so, undoubtedly, it's uh, it's increased the labour requirement of of, uh, of having a system that's right. Um, but excuse me, that you know the payoffs, uh, the payoffs in terms of. Um, more professionalism, uh, more consistent service, etc., that we can provide our customers and so on because of the things that we know, you know. So a customer can ring about a job or something and uh, my service guy on the phone can instantly call up the job, see the history and all those sorts of things. So just the level of professionalism that you can provide versus looking like you know nothing about nothing uh, is is, is a massive payoff. You know, for me, uh, being a numbers man, uh, you know, um, a lot of my business decisions are made around numbers. So, you know, I will sit down and do some analysis on the, uh, the, the, the numbers of different parts that we sell or the stock that we carry and how many days does it take to turn over or things like that. Uh, and, and so for me, uh, that sort of information is, is, is absolutely essential from a business point of view. You know, uh, I hate trying to run a business without having the information at my fingertips to, to make decisions. And sometimes they're fairly major decisions, you know, and, and uh, you know, a gut feel is good, but but subjectivity is, is a dangerous thing sometimes because you can ask your guys and, and they, you know, they, they will always remember the, the one time that something sort of uh, didn't work or whatever. And so that, that becomes their answer. It's, oh, yeah, that doesn't work or whatever. You know, they, they forget the 20 times that it did sort of work and so on. So I much prefer objective data. So something like, uh, you know, an enterprise management system for us has, has, been, has been critical in the scheme of things. So that's the one bit of technology that we have uh, done. I, I, I'd sort of love to put others, put others and so on in, but it is, it's a case of the time. Someone has to have the time to uh, evaluate them and, and um, you know, decide on whether it really is worth it or not. Yeah, great. All right, well, thanks for your time, Mark. That uh, was my last question. Um, so, yeah, thanks for All your right. time and uh, we'll catch up soon. Okay, thanks, Mark. The Go for Growth Show. Powered by Beepo.